Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Downstream Processing Challenges in Cell Therapy Manufacturing. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Terumo BCT. Terumo BCT, a global leader in blood component, therapeutic apheresis, and cellular technologies, believes in the potential of blood and cells to do even more for patients than they do today. Terumo BCT's cell therapy technologies business enables researchers, developers, and manufacturers to create next generation cell and gene therapies. To learn more, visit www.terumobct.com slash machine efficiency. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by typing it into the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speakers, Jim Belzer, PhD, and Jeffrey Yule, MBA, who are both from Terumo BCT. Dr. Belzer is the Senior Manager of Global Strategic Medical Affairs for Cell Therapy Technologies. He recently transitioned to this team to better leverage his technical background and the commercial exposure he's gained during his more than seven years at the company. Prior to joining the cell processing team at Terumo BCT, Dr. Belzer was the lead scientist at Corning Life Sciences for the R&D of Synthemax, a synthetic growth surface for the culture of human embryonic stem cells. He was a co-founder of RET Corporation and was a key player in the industrialization of several technology platforms, including Phage Display and Yeast2 Hybrid. He has more than 25 years of industrial research and development experience in a broad range of disciplines. Jeffrey Yule is the Senior Engineering Manager for Cell Processing. Jeff leads the product development efforts for the Cell Therapy Technologies portfolio. He previously led teams engaged in the development of single-use disposable medical devices across several Terumo BCT product lines. Prior to joining the company, Jeff developed complex electromechanical systems in the fields of medical simulation and laboratory instrumentation. Throughout his 18-year career, Jeff has earned three U.S. patents for his contributions to product development efforts. Jim Belzer and Jeff Yule will now begin their presentations. Thank you. Today I'd like to present some of the challenges that, are, that we face in downstream processing for cell therapy manufacturing. My agenda today will be first to review the regenerative medicine marketplace, and then I'd like to talk about where we are, what's the state of the art in cell therapy manufacturing. Uh, like to review some of the upstream manufacturing decisions that we make as we're doing process development. And the main part of the talk will be downstream processing technologies overview with a highlight at the, uh, at the very end, uh, highlighting the, the uh, Terumo Finia fill and finish system. So the regenerative mark medicine market worldwide, there's about 900 companies that are working in, the, in this space. So it is very well represented all around the world right now uh, and is growing. As you can see at the end of 2017, there were 770. So uh, remarkable growth in this uh, space. If you look at the number of clinical trials that are going on in this space, you see that we have over a thousand clinical trials uh, at the end of 2018. 
Uh, that's up from uh, 200, uh, roughly 200 from 2017. And you can see that they're pretty well distributed between gene therapy, uh, gene modified cell therapy, and cell therapy with a few uh, tissue engineering uh, projects or uh, clinical trials as well. Finally, most of those uh, trials are in oncology, uh, cardiovascular, and uh, musculoskeletal uh, issues come in uh, second and third. Uh, pretty much all of the, the uh, indications that are in normal big pharma indications are, are targeted by regenerative medicine as well. So this is a slide from uh, uh, John Rowley of Rooster Bio, and he, he's promoting the product cycle model of innovation. And in this slide, he shows what he says is that the cell therapy product innovation curve is a bit on the downhill slope, but the cell manufacturing process innovation curve is very much uh, on the upslope, so sort of logarithmic growth, if you will. Uh, so he said, we are now in a, a phase of maximum increase of the rate of manufacturing process innovation. Now, I may argue with it, John, whether or not we are actually on the downhill slide of cell therapy product innovation. I would argue that we're not. But I do agree with John that we are in a phase of, of innovation for cell therapy manufacturing. And uh, Chris Roy over at the... Uh, Georgia Tech has set up the National Cell Manufacturing Consortium, and they have decided to support three separate manufacturing platforms. So MSCs for regenerative medicine, uh, CAR T cells for cancer immunotherapy, and finally IPSC cardiomyocytes for cardiac uh, regener regeneration applications. Along with accepting those challenges, so the uh, National Cell Manufacturing Consortium is trying to establish best practices for cell therapy manufacturing, and they've identified a number of gaps that uh, they're addressing. So in addition to looking at three different uh, manufacturing platforms, they're, they're trying to learn how the process affects cell quality and thereby derive new CQAs, uh, critical quality attributes, or new safety tests, efficacy, and potency assays. Additionally, they're trying to develop new tools, and I'm sure everybody's heard about inline testing, sensors, uh, you know, real-time uh, image processing, so a lot of, a lot of uh, New, new tools that need to, to be uh, invented at this stage. And finally, the goal is to how to, do, how to develop high quality, large scale and low cost cells for regenerative medicine. And that's important that we try to understand if the pro product is the process, so if we have isolation, expansion, sorting, we need to understand how that process is affecting our cells because unlike biologics, we're actually introducing live cells into the as the drug product. So a cell therapy roadmap, this is really the process that you go through from uh, starting at the bench where you have dis dis demonstrated uh, clinical value to a specific disease through uh, your experiments. Uh, that looks promising, so you go into process development uh, to develop manufacturing and testing. Uh, finally, if you're going to actually do that testing, you may have to scale up, so increase yield, decrease cost, especially if you're trying to commercialize all of this. So as this cell therapy process uh, evolves here, you can see that there are little arrows connecting these boxes so that if a change is made as you're scaling up in your process, remember the product is the process, you may have to go all the way back to the discovery phase in order to, to make changes to assure yourself that you haven't changed the cells in that. And finally, in the last stage, we get to delivery, preclinical, and clinical manufacturing. So this is a, a traditional cell th therapy manufacturing roadmap. So remember this process that I've shown just before here is happening in this context as well. So if we make, this shows here at the beginning we have cell line development, master cell bank and working cell bank and cell culture. 
So that's really just up to the expansion phase. And what we're going to talk about today is basically after the harvest. So in addition, we have chances to affect the quality of our cells as we go through cell wash and concentrate, formulate, fill and finish, cryopreservation, and shipping, and all before getting to the end user handling steps. So here's one way uh, to look at some of the process development decisions that we make uh, as we're developing a process uh, for cells. So this is just a different way to look at the same material. So you can see the manufacturing process is broken up into large tasks. Here we have tissue procurement, cell manufacturing, storage, distribution, and patient administration. Now the gray arrow underneath uh, shows really what's on the company's mind. So in the beginning, we're worried about the cost per million cells as we're developing cells to, to deliver to patients. Uh, once we understand our treatment well enough, it's going to be in say phase one, we'll be interested in the cost per dose or the cost per treatment as we scale up. And it's only really at the last box, uh, our last uh, end of this uh, cycle, when we get to patient administration, that we can actually make some of that money back. So we want to look at how those de development process, development decisions affect the cost of your process and how many of them are baked in from the very beginning of the process. And the first is this tissue procurement. So we have basically uh, a couple of choices. We can go with autologous uh, cell expansions or we can go with uh, allogeneic cell expansions. So obviously the market would like to have off-the-shelf uh, solutions and the allogeneic is, is deemed to be less expensive because of centralized processing and scale-up and we only have one or one or a few donors to validate. You do have additional concerns as you worry about cold chain and transport. Autologous uh, presents other challenges, so it's usually typically a multi-center process. Uh, there will be scale out rather than scale up, and donor variability is one of the big problems you'll be struggling with here. Now, if we want to look at the cell manufacturing piece of this, so we here we have lots of uh, buckets. Materials is the first one, facility and processing. So processing is probably the part that we most think about as cell therapy manufacturing. That's the cell expansion, but believe me, there's a lot that goes on before then. So in materials, you could be making decisions about the base media, whether you're going to use serum or serum-free media, what growth factors needed to be, need to be added uh, to keep those cells healthy and happy. If you're using a single-use disposable, just remember that you'll be locked into that disposable through the life of the product. Uh, you may have to buy microcarriers or activation beads or self-sorting materials, magnetic beads. Uh, you'll have to purchase release agents, cryoprotectant, uh, freezing bags, vials, uh, excipients. So the number of decisions around your initial materials is huge in the, in the beginning of your process development. In the facility, it's sort of the same argument as what your choices are going to be for uh, autologous versus allogeneic. So if you have a fresh uh, product, then you're going to have a multi-center with a complex technology transfer. That's going to be more expensive than a frozen product, uh, maybe even sent to a central processing or a CMO. Uh, similarly, if you're working with your uh, labor costs are going to be lower if you've got closed systems and automated systems than with open uh, planar-based cultureware. And finally, we get to the processing. This is the traditional decisions that you think about when you're uh, scaling up or scaling out or even just developing a, a, a regenerative medicine process. So the lot size determines your hardware and you then get the choice between a stirred tank bioreactor, plus or minus microcarriers, hollow fiber bioreactors, multi-layer stacks, or flask-based uh, systems. And it's important to remember that as you increase the number of cells you're uh, producing in the expansion step, that you're increasing or producing, actually, a downstream processing bottleneck uh, with those increased numbers of cells. 
So finally, just in summary of those process development decisions, it looks like a lot of your cost is centered around labor and materials. Uh, current processes, and I think this is uh, true of the industry, we're lacking automation and manpower. And as I've just pointed out, many of your process decisions are made early in process develop development. Autologous versus allogeneic, materials from media to freezer bags, facilities, lot size, and what type of expansion system, whether it's a stirred tank or a hollow fiber bioreactor. So if we look at what we've covered so far, we've really only covered the first part of our therapeutic delivery roadmap, and now I'd like to concentrate on some of the downstream processing choices that we have. So this is just the big buckets here I put out. So do downstream processing choices are after harvest, we have rinse, release, quench, and test those cells. We have uh, cell wash and concentrate, reduce volume here, so that can be done through centrifugation. Tangential flow filtration or elutriation technology, or other, otherwise known as counterflow centrifugation. We have cryo vials, freezer bags, and, and other types of sealed vials to choose from, and we get to choose our, our storage, uh, whether it's liquid nitrogen or refri refrigerated. So this is just a general downstream processing checklist. I've sort of bolded the uh, table stakes, so I'd say a downstream processing uh, uh, would, downstream process would need to be GMP compliant. Uh, it would need to include some automation, single-use uh, disposables, fully closed, scalable. Uh, the biggest problem you're going up against here is you want to keep the processing time as small as possible, label-free. Obviously, you don't get all of these choices in every product, uh, so we'll go ahead and talk about some of these uh, downstream processing choices. Here we go. So downstream processing limitations, the bottleneck, I'm going to talk first about MSC processes because we have a short time window to transfer the cells from culture medium, and in the case of MSCs, culture medium and attached to a surface to the cryopreserved state, so in a freezer vial or bag with a cryoprotectant and at minus 130 to 150 degrees centigrade. So. Jocelyn at Al, uh, the reference I have at the bottom of the screen here, has stated that for allogeneic production, that capacity right now in 2018 is limited to around 150 to 200 liters per batch, just because of that limited processing time. You don't want your cells at the beginning, uh, right after harvest to be different than the cells that go into the freezer. So first step, we're going to be thinking about detaching those cells uh, our MSCs from the supernatant, and we'll need to optimize time, pH, temperature, and enzymatic quenching as part of our process development. So each, har each method will have a specific uh, process for harvesting. So in the case of stir tank bioreactors, now we'll have uh, MSCs on microcarriers. And in this particular case, you'll want to have a dissociation agent, probably a recombinant one like trypsin or triple or triple select. Uh, and then to release the cells from those microcarriers, you'll want to increase the impeller agitation. So those, are, those two facts are actually con could contribute to a decrease in the critical quality attributes of your cells. So we want to make sure that we keep our cells as healthy and happy as as possible. So we want to keep our harvesting efficiency at greater than 95% when we want to keep our cells healthy and happy. And in order to do that in a stirred tank bioreactor, we have to take into consideration uh, the stresses uh, put on, shear stresses put on by the stir, uh, by the impeller. And so I'll talk briefly in the next slide about the Kolmogorov scale, which seeks to tame those forces. And then Finally, just one last point for MSCs on microcarriers. It saves time and reduces steps if you actually do that release step in the uh, expansion chamber. So now to talk about the Kolmogorov scale and impeller speed. So on the left-hand side of the, of the figure, you can see uh, microcarriers in red, and the streamlines are the uh, 
the eddies or the shear force in blue. And as long as those streamlines are larger or spaced larger than the microcarriers, then there will be very little damage to the cells, very little shear damage to the cells. If, however, as is shown on the, on the case on the right, your uh, shear lines are closer together and smaller than the actual microcarrier, again shown in red here, then you have the possibility of shear damage to your cells grown on those beads. So this is a very simplistic case of managing this process. Uh, there are more, much more sophisticated ways of doing it. Finally, uh, if we're harvesting from a, a hollow fiber or a pack bed bioreactor, we'll require, also require a release agent, but now we don't have all the same tools. Now we can increase the time and we can increase our pump speed or the flow rate uh, or maybe even the rotation of a culture vessel. Uh, alternatively, you could use different uh, environmentally responsive polymers, that would eliminate the need for trypsin or recombinant release agents. Uh, these uh, environmentally responsive polymers uh, react to temperature or to pH. One of the criticisms is that they may result in cell sheets being formed rather than single cell suspensions. So once the cells are released from the substrate or released from the microcarriers, uh, we need to quench the uh, trypsin EDTA release agents in the solution. And this can be done with media containing serum, uh, with, a serum with a trypsin inhibitor, by dilution, by simply washing out and resuspending in fresh media. Now, uh, downstream processing, obviously, we don't want to infuse the patient with microcarriers. A couple of different ways. These are the old school ways to get rid of microcarriers and to process cells after harvest. Uh, they both involve uh, swinging bucket centrifugation or dead end filtration. So both of these methods are not easily automated. And so we'll talk about a couple of alternatives to these tried and true, although manual methods. The first I'd like to present uh, is counterflow centrifugation or elutriation, and this can be found in Trumo's Elutra and in Sartorius's KSEP. And here we have a fluidized bed for low shear. So you can see on the far right, the centrifugation force is uh, towards the floor in this particular diagram, but we have a counterflow of media, the small arrow pointing towards the ceiling here at the bottom of the fluidized bed chamber. So this is good for reducing volume washing and can handle lot sizes up to hundreds of liters. Now the first two uh, field flow fractionation techniques, I put a big stamp of experimental on these. They're used uh, probably coming soon to a, to a cell process near you. Uh, but not quite ready for prime time. The acoustic wave uh, filtration, uh, right now it's best used and used in small microfluidic platforms, so scale is an issue there. And dielectrophoresis, where we're basically using an electric field instead of a membrane, and that can be used to select rare cells. Now, uh, two techniques that are often used in cell therapy manufacturing, usually to characterize cells, but the fluorescent activated cell sorting and magnetic activated cell sorting uh, are on the last category here. And they have a drawback in that they require labeling, but they are both highly selective and they are uh, very essential to our characterization studies, but perhaps not to wash and concentrate steps. Another method that's quite, uh, in fact, it's probably the most commonly used in the wash and concentrate is tangential flow filtration. And here we have a bundle of hollow fibers, uh, usually pre-sterilized. Uh, it's got monitors to, to make sure that it doesn't foul. Uh, so it's got integrated pressure sensors. And you can see here that, that the cells stay in the hollow fibers, whereas the uh, permeate is allowed to pass through the hollow fibers into and away from the cells. And at this point in the process, we would be looking for automated uh, fill and finish. So uh, keep that in mind. 
Uh, I'm going to continue on with the process here, but we will be talking about in more detail about Terumo's uh, fill and Finia fill and finish system in a few moments. So now as we move, uh, so now we've washed and concentrated, we've filled and finished our uh, cells. We're going to do uh, controlled rate freezing. So it's important to freeze your cells below minus 130 degrees C. Uh, it was stated that that is uh, that all measurable biological activity ceases below that number. I think that's interesting. Uh, optimal flow, optimal post-thaw for cell survival means that we freeze very slowly. And as we will talk about at the end, is that once we have frozen them, the, the thawing is actually the opposite. It's thawing very quickly. So once samples reach minus 80, they can be transferred to the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen. Now we'll have uh, cryopreservation formulation. This would have gone in before. Uh, usually it consists of DMSO and a storage media that optimizes ionic strength, pH, and free radical scavengers. So those formulated cells would go into either cryo vials, cryo bags, and those bags and vials need to be submergible in liquid nitrogen and they shouldn't be contributing more particulates. This is one, one of the uh, constant uh, concerns of, of folks packaging and doing final uh, fill and finish for uh, cells is that they, you don't want to introduce more particulates into the patient. Finally, cold chain is a big issue and it, it actually starts at the very beginning when you acquire your cells or your tissues and continues until you actually reintroduce the cells into the patient. For short-term storage and transport, you want to maintain that temperature. Uh, uh, here I have a minus 150, but we're really talking about uh, short trips, four hours, less than half a day. Liquid nitrogen absorbed in a non-spillable format with uh, date, time, and temperature alarms, both audible and visual. And the old lab trick of using styrofoam and dry ice is uh, really not acceptable for this uh, storage. For longer trips, we would need to maintain that temperature for up to seven days. And again, we use liquid nitrogen, and these uh, containers can safely transport hundreds of vials, and they continuously log the temperature inside and outside during shipping. And finally, you'll need an archival uh, storage tank to keep all of these uh, cells uh, for as long as the patients are still uh, being treated. And so you'll need large uh, liquid nitrogen storage tanks. Finally, when the cells are delivered to the patients, uh, rapid thawing, as I've already hinted at, is the best way to maintain high viability. And so to do that, I think we need to automate this step as well. So a solid state device is preferable. Water baths uh, result in incomplete thawing, higher contamination risk, and they're not really GMP compatible. So, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Yule, who will uh, discuss the Finia Fill and Finish System. So, pictured here is the Finia Fill and Finish System, which is an automated system for final formulation and filling of cryopreservation bags. So, the device is fully automated, and it utilizes a sterile single-use disposable that is functionally closed throughout the process. It's maintained functionally closed by connecting incoming materials with a Terumo sterile connection device. The Finia fill and finish system can cool incoming products. It can mix them to formulate a homogeneous solution. It performs air removal on the final product bags and then aliquots into cryopreservation bags and finally performs an RF seal so the bags are ready to remove from the system to take to the controlled rate freezer. The automated cooling is controlled by an integrated chiller system with a settable range between zero and 15 degrees centigrade. We have infrared sensors that monitor the process temperature for the incoming materials into the product bag. And there are integrated chilling plates that contact the mixing bag as well as the final product bags to keep them at the uh, set temperature. We have automated mixing for up to three incoming materials, 
which would typically be cells, some sort of media or buffer to adjust cell concentration, and finally a cryoprotectant, typically DMSO, as Jim had mentioned previously. The device provides automated dispensing in up to three product bags and one quality control bag. The system is controlled by the operator through a touchscreen interface, and materials are controlled with an integrated barcode scanner. Now we'll dive into some of the specific features on the Finiofil and Finish system. On the top right, you can see a material bag holder on the outside of the system. This is where you hang your incoming materials, cells, media, and cryoprotectant. Beneath that is indicated a load sensor. That is what manages the volumes that are being transferred into the system and then ultimately into the product bags. That load sensor converts from weight to volume using the specific gravity of any fluid. You see two peristaltic pumps as well as some tubing holders which are used to route the tubing uh, appropriately on the system. The product bags hang on the left side and they're integrated into cooling plates. Above the product bag holders, you can see automatic, automatic RF sealing valves. Those valves both control the flow into each of the product bags, as well as perform a final RF seal so the bag can be removed. There's also a fluid sensor to detect fluid and air throughout the process. And you see that mixer and cooling plate, which cools the incoming products and also uh, has alternating mixing paddles to ensure a homogeneous solution. Lower down on the device, you can see the touchscreen monitor in its kind of resting place. Um, so that slides out from the system, and that's where the operator provides all the interaction again through a touchscreen. We see towards the right there is disposable tube routing to ensure that the tube is coming out of the door system appropriately, and we also have a handheld barcode reader to scan all incoming materials. The Finia system uses two disposable sets with different configurations of product bags. The first configuration on the top shows three uh, product bags that are origin CS250 bags. And those have a volume range for cryopreservation from 29 to 70 mils. We also have one quality control bag, which has a volume that uh, the user can define between 10 and 40 mils. The bag on the right with the conical shape towards the bottom is the interim bag for mixing. And then the line to the right is where incoming materials are sterile docked to bring into the set. The set on the bottom shows a different configuration with three smaller product bags, which allow volume ranges from 10 to 28 mils in the product bag. And that set as well, we, we do allow 10 to 40 mils in that quality control bag. So this is a kind of high-level process flow of how the Finia Film and Finish system executes final formulation and dispensing into cryopreservation bags. So we break it into three sections. The first is machine preparation. An operator will first log into the machine and select the protocol. The device then performs a load sensor check to ensure that the calibration is still valid for that load sensor. The operator will enter target product volumes for what they want in the product and QC bags and target material volumes, which is the amount of incoming material, again, cells, buffer, and cryo, typically, that will be introduced into the system. The operator can then scan the barcode on the disposable set to confirm they're using the right type and transfer the disposable set information into the run report. The tubing set is then loaded onto the finia, and then it moves into the final formulation step. So once the doors close, the system can proceed, and the operator starts by scanning the barcode on material one and ensuring that it has been uh, connected via a sterile weld to the finia tubing set. The device adds material one, and then if a two-component or three-component material uh, addition protocol is selected, um, after the first material is added, it's cooled, the temperature is maintained, and then a second material can be added after that barcode has been scanned. If you're doing a three-component mater material protocol, then you'll scan the, the barcode on the third material to ensure that you have an appropriate material three, and that's added into the mixing bag. Anytime that prot fluid is being introduced into the mixing bag, um, the mixing paddles are engaging that bag 
which both holds it up against the cold plate to control temperature, as well as ensuring a homogeneous uh, mixture in that bag. Once all the mixing and cooling has been achieved with your up to three incoming materials, uh, the fill and finish steps proceed. And that's where first air is removed from the final product bags to prepare them for cryopreservation. And then the material is aliquoted out into up to the three product bags and the QC bags. The device then seals those product bags. The doors can be opened and the product bags can be removed and taken to the controlled rate freezer. And with that, I would like to open it to any questions for either Dr. Belter or myself. Thank you, Jim and Jeff, for your presentations. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Jim Beltzer and Jeff Yule will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question is, what are the current potency assays used to monitor specific MSC number and function during expansion and downstream processing? Uh, well, I think the uh, current potency assays are pretty much uh, true potency assays are indication specific. So they would be looking for uh, a relative disease state in a small animal model or a cell-based model. MSCs are the poster child for potency assays because there are really no great potency assays. And the flow markers that we currently use don't really tell you whether you've got 100% MSCs. So I think the uh, advances in the understanding of your process is going to be really uh, critical as well as real-time monitoring so that you can see changes along the way. But right now we don't have good markers for Thank you. Um, is 5% DMSO sufficient for cryopreservation of all cells? So I, I, would, I would never say that anything is working for all cells. So everybody's cells turn out to be different because the product is the process, as I mentioned earlier in the discussion. So uh, really, uh, to determine the proper level of DMSO would be done empirically. I don't think you would just a blanket case and it's going to work for everything. Thank you. How much is given up in consistency and viability at this lower concentration? Uh, I, like I said, I think that is a, that is a specific uh, process, specific uh, question. I can't answer that as to how much will be given up by different concentrations of DMS. So that would have to be determined empirically. Okay, thank you. Next one is, will the Finia fill cryovials for commercial products? Uh, currently, Finia is designed around uh, filling into cryopreservation bags, as was indicated on that slide. So we have two configurations of disposable set uh, with product bags, either a CS250 bag, which has a freezing range from 29 to 70 milliliters, or a CS25 a CS50 bag, which has a freezing range from 10 liters. Thank you. Are the cells washed prior to being processed through the finia? Yes, in the process, you'll notice that the wash and concentrate all precedes the formula fill and finish uh, functions of the finia. So, in the in the typical process, you would harvest your cells, you would wash and concentrate to remove your, perhaps your enzyme, your enzyme, to do any buffer exchanges, to concentrate your cells. And then those, those cells, once they are at the proper concentration, probably uh, because you've already considered what concentration they need to be at before adding the DMSO. So all of the wash and concentrate uh, would precede uh, finia use. Thank you. Next one is, will Finia be able to do more than three bags in the future? It's possible to expand Finia from a technology perspective. One of the things we like to maintain with this device is consistency across all the product bags and the quality control bag. And that means from when all your incoming materials have been added, we want to be able to aliquot into the product bags, remove air, seal the bags, and get those cellular mixtures to the 
uh, controlled rate freezer in, uh, in a consistent amount of time. You do 50 bags. And while we can engineer solutions there, it becomes increasingly more difficult to prove that your first bag and your last bag have experienced the same conditions when you take them to the controlled rate freezer. So plans right now is to uh, have Finia with uh, the three product bags and, and one QC bag. Thank you. Next one is, is this fill finish system currently for sale? As of next week, uh, Finia will be uh, available for sale. Um, we have certain geographies that are available, uh, certainly English-speaking countries uh, in, in North America, uh, some in Asia, and follow-on uh, geographic availability will be in six months as uh, additional language sets are added to the device. Next one is, how much time does the Finia process require on average? So based on the testing we've done for our nominal runs, uh, the Finia process finishes in, in typically 30, 35 minutes. Um, one of the important time parameters that we like to maintain is once uh, the amount of time to finish a procedure from when cells have experienced contact with cryopreservative. And we enforce uh, restrictions on our process can complete in less than 25 minutes from when the cells have first experienced cryo. Procedure time does vary, though, based on uh, targeted volumes, as well as the temperature profile of incoming materials. Thank you. Dr. Beltzer, you noted that approximately 61% of COGS is based on labor and materials, and that current processes lack automation and manpower. For what part or steps of the process do you have the greatest concern going forward or hope and expectation for improvement? Yeah, so my, my biggest uh, concern and where I think the biggest gains will be had is actually in understanding your process. So in the development of, as the first one of the first questions discussed, the development of relevant potency assays and relevant cell markers is really critical to the uh, advancement of the entire field right now. I think that the real-time monitoring is going to give us uh, data that we haven't had access to in the past that will uh, try to keep these processes within the guardrails a little bit better. So first things first, understand your process. Thank you. Next one is for Jeff. Jeff, is it correct that the Finia has three product bags and a QC bag? And why is that? And do you expect to add more bags to the system in the future? Answering previously, we are at three, three product bags and a quality control bag. And that allows us to formulate uh, three uh, doses for a patient while maintaining a, a retained sample. So we enforce a, a quality control bag for each procedure. And as I touched upon before, uh, we're currently staying with three product bags to ensure consistency uh, across those bags, mainly from a time that cells are exposed to DNA them to the controlled rate freezer. Thank you. How is the volume measured and controlled in the product bags? So volume on Finia is managed in two ways. One, by the peristaltic pumps which have a uh, displacement for each turn of the pump. So we can uh, understand how much fluid has been pumped by, by those peristaltic pumps. In addition, that interim mixing bag hangs on a precise load sensor. It uses the specific gravity of your fluid to convert weight to volume. So throughout that procedure, we can manage the volume and the sets by comparing how much the pumps have uh, accumulated uh, in transferring volume, as well as the volume that's been either added to that mixing bag or taken away from that mixing bag. Thank you. How long does it take to complete a full filler finish cycle or process? Before these procedures uh, typically finish in, in around 30 minutes, and we maintain that uh, time where cryopreservative has been in contact with cells to less than 25 minutes. 
Okay, thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question. Why is the volume limit on the larger disposables set at 174 milliliters when you would expect up to 250 milliliters using the maximum bag volume of the set? Well, one of the important uh, specifications of what Finia can deliver into the product bags is a uniform concentration of cells and cryopreservative. So that mixing bag is uh, up against a refrigerated plate to maintain temperature, but there are also two mixing paddles that we use to uh, keep the, the cells in suspension and, and to create a homogenous mixture that we use. Um, we can demonstrate uh, that critical performance parameter of less than 5% concentration uh, variability across those product bags when we have up to 174 mils in that mixing bag. I would like to once again thank Jim Beltzer and Jeff Yule for their presentations. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, Terumo BCT, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Until next time, goodbye.